So Neela, let's start with your background. So what did you do before your current roles? Um, okay, gosh. So my background is a bit, I guess, unconventional for development. I didn't start out in development. Um, I actually started in the private sector in sales and marketing. So way, way back, I got an MBA um, after an undergraduate degree in economics. And I actually worked in, in India. I grew up in India and I studied in India and uh, got an MBA and then started in sales and marketing with a couple of multinational companies. So first uh, Nestle and then Unilever. Um, and then I joined a strategy consulting firm, Accenture. Uh, it had just transitioned from being Anderson Consulting to Accenture and worked on a number of marketing strategy projects. So all told, I was in India for about eight years after my MBA. And then I went to, uh, to Wharton to get a PhD in marketing. And when I was getting my PhD in marketing, I actually uh, was exposed to a lot of behavioral science work, behavioral economics work. But I still wasn't thinking about development. Uh, it was still very private sector. And after my PhD, um, which is about five, six years, I think, I um, joined back into the private sector. So I didn't take up a tenure track job in academia. Um, and I joined Pepsi in New York. So still private sector, consumer insights, sales and marketing. And then about three years ago, I actually um, got a call from the head of the Gates Foundation in India saying, we are looking to set up a center for social and behavior change at one of the new universities, Ashoka University. We're looking to fund the center and you seem to have a good background in marketing and behavior change. And would you consider working with us at the center? And uh, I had been involved in a lot of, you know, with the life you can save with other organizations and with EA for about, by this point for about five to seven years. So I was definitely interested, but I hadn't made a career change. So this was in 2017. And so obviously this was a, a dream job. Uh, so we relocated from New York to New Delhi, India uh, for a couple of years and I set up the center. And then last year we returned and I'm now in uh, Washington DC. And uh, I'm sort of an independent consultant for now. Um, so I do a couple of things. I'm still in the space of uh, what I would call development and uh, marketing slash behavior change. Uh, so I work as a senior advisor with the Busara Center for Behavioral Economics. They are based out of Nairobi. And uh, the idea is to advance behavioral science for poverty alleviation. I also work with uh, the Sergo Foundation. They're based out of Washington, DC. And they do work uh, to bring data behavior science, artificial intelligence to solve problems, demand problems in public health. Um, and I'm also an advisor at uh, Adwara Money, which does work in financial inclusion in India. Uh, again, really advising them on the behavioral side of things. And then of course, through this for the last many years, I've been involved in Peter Singer's, the organization that Peter co-founded, The Life You Can Save. Uh, and last year, I actually uh, got onto the board. So I play a pretty uh, active role there um, on the board of the Life You Can Save. So that's been my journey over the last, I guess, well, 25 years. That's absolutely amazing. So what prompted you to move from the private sector to applying your skills in the uh, nonprofit sector? Um, I don't think there was any one particular, but of course, you know, growing up in a country like India and you see the kind of poverty and extreme suffering about you, you can't, I mean, at some point, everyone does think about what can I do, uh, especially if you know you're fortunate enough to be amongst those elite, you know, good education, stable house, etc. Uh, but it's always sort of a dormant thing. And in most cases, what we do is some sort of neighbor social work or, you know, contribute to the lowest. I think when I was in the PhD program, and because the focus of my work was experimental, I thought, wow, this is a really good way to test intuitions. Uh, and I'd been in marketing before that where, you know, you have a lot of intuitions, a lot of ideas and a lot of creative ideas, but no real way to test them. And I said, this is a really mm. good way that you run an experiment. Why, why, aren't, why aren't we doing that in the nonprofit sector, in the development sector? You know, I, I can never choose... Uh, what charity or cause to support. Everyone sounds just the same. They're so emotional. It's so heart-rending, but I don't even know if, I'm, if it's having any impact. Uh, and so I've chosen to stay out of, you know, development work altogether because I thought it was very, like, it was too emotional and there was no impact. I couldn't see anything. 
and having grown up with this MBA mindset was very solution oriented, right? So I said, why can't I do something? And I literally got onto Google searches and searched for, you know, experiments plus poverty alleviation. I think I must have done something like that. And at this was 2010, 2009, 2010. So I hopped on the I hopped on some work that, you know, Esther Duflo was doing at that point with randomized control trials, realized, oh, what we call experiments in psychology is, you know, when you take it to the field, it's randomized control trials, this could be interesting. From there, got a link to IPA, started reading all their work. And I think from there sort of started to, uh, IPA started popping up as effective altruism. And I think from there started actually getting into the effective altruism work. So. So I think it's a sense of growing up, being visibly exposed to that kind of poverty and the inequality for which you have no answers. But then also, I think through a long process, figuring out what I could do with my skills and interests, uh, you know, that the, uh, with this. And I think that the community has really helped to at least make me think about that in a more reasoned and rational way. That's incredible. So really, you have so many different hats. So do you have a typical day? I know this has changed a lot for us, you know, since like everything that's happened in the last months. But like, for you, what would a typical day look like? In well, the world? last few months are obviously I've been, uh, you know, I like to call it a gap year as, a, as I'm exploring opportunities for what to do next and how to contribute. But uh, it's fascinating because a lot of the work that I, I mean, all of the work that I do is advisory. So, you know, I necessarily can't do grassroots level work. I'm not in the country in which countries in which, you know, the work gets done. So I see my role as sort of amplifying, facilitating and advising so that other people can do their work better. Um, and so a typical day would be uh, like this morning, you know, there's a research project where we are looking very interestingly at sort of an understudied concept of dignity. Started with somebody in a marketing school saying it has implications for marketing, but it also has huge implications, obviously, for the way we conduct development interventions. Um, particularly having come back from, quote unquote, the global south, which is where, you know, 88% of the world's population is, I feel very strongly that, uh, that we need to have more of that voice uh, amplified. So this concept of sort of what is dignity and what is power really is something I'm interested in. So, you know, something from sort of can we design research to show that there are real implications for treating people respectfully um, to sort of looking at and right now I'm involved in a lot of COVID-19 messaging. So really helping out a few groups with, uh, you know, what what is the data saying? How can we maybe design better messaging? What are we doing about it? So it's a mix of, I would say, looking at data. Uh, I don't really generate did the data are lots of great people who do that it's really looking at the data what are the insights on a particular problem area uh, it could be around designing the messaging or communication to actually test it and it could be reviewing the results of that to then provide more advice and, and information yeah and from my work on uh, behavioral change within philanthropic giving uh, with the giving games project like really understanding what motivates people to act uh, is so critical to so many development projects so it seems as though you have an absolutely like incredible and detailed portfolio so how do you pick which projects to become involved in and what do you find particularly inspiring about different projects that allows you to choose I think it's hard, but you know, the one thing I'm trying to do, so I love to do everything. I say yes to far more things than, uh, than I can actually do. Uh, but I do think that it, it's worth thinking about, I mean, I try and think about, is this something I can do or someone else can do? So like I said, you know, I'd love to do grassroots level project execution, but one given where I am. And secondly, you know, I don't believe, I actually don't believe in sitting in the US and flying out to, you know, India or Kenya or Uganda for two weeks doing the work and coming back. So because that's my philosophy, I felt that I wouldn't be as useful doing say project execution work. So if someone says, can you do this? I say, well, that's not really me. Mm -hmm. um, I also know that, you know, I need to learn a lot more about health policy and, uh, and you know, health, health uh, structural issues. So I avoid weighing in on that because, you know, although I could do that, it's really where your comparative advantage is, right? Maybe I could do that given my management background, but, you know, someone else is probably better suited. Uh, so especially I think as an independent consultant, you have to think very carefully about where your leverage is. 
and where you are best suited to actually advance something versus you'll get a lot of projects that of course you're better, maybe better than the next person, but not that much better that you say, this is the best use of my time. Uh, so, so one, it has to be in an area that I like. So um, instinctively having been exposed to all areas, livelihoods, education, health, I really like public health. I mean, it just resonates with me in a way that uh, the others less so. So, um, so I, I choose projects mainly in public health. And, and the second big area of passion I have is I think especially seeing country disparities is um, charitable giving. So, you know, the fact that a dollar can go a long way overseas is just, it's, it's just such an amazing concept. And the fact that, you know, you don't have to leave the United States of America, Australia, or UK to actually do a lot of good is just such an easy concept that I feel like the need to evangelize about it, which is the work with the life you can save. So if projects fall in sort of those areas, public health, um, or this that's one filter another filter is you know what can i learn from this so some projects have taken up like dwara money it's in financial inclusion uh, but because it's a very interesting sort of idea and there was already something in place and i felt like wow i mean this is a bit challenging i don't quite know what i'm doing here but i can really learn so is there some particular skill i can pick up and i try and be as concrete about that as possible, not generally like, is this good learning, but what exactly would I learn? Uh, that's another filter, I think, because time is really the constraint here. So you really have to make choices, uh, much more so than if this were regular work and you know, I know what to do. Yeah, absolutely. So really ideas about uh, what you can learn, like uh, time prioritization, like all of these ideas, I think that we all like know, but then need to like act on, <laughs> which is where I sometimes uh, struggle. It's like, you know, getting to that point. Right. And then I think just recognizing your constraints and saying, mm -hmm. what can I change? And, uh, you know, you'd love to do everything, but given where I am, what I'm doing and where I am with all the constraints, what's the best that I can do? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So I think that during a time, you know, where we are all looking for some, you know, good news, like, what are some particular achievements of yours recently or the organisations you work on that you've been particularly proud of? <laughs> That's a hard one. You know, it's all work in progress. But mm -hmm. I think I'm really proud of setting up the Centre for Social and Behaviour Change in India. And, you know, for a country that's 1.3 billion people and and just uh, you would think there's a lot going on. There is a lot going on, but it's not, uh, you know, people aren't that connected. And uh, just bringing some new thinking and saying, you know, could we, for example, use these new ideas from behavioral science or from data in a way to solve these public health problems? Um, and building a center is hard. I mean, it's, you know, it's you have to do things in the short run to actually get it up and going. Uh, sometimes, you know, two years isn't enough to solve anything. So I don't think, I wouldn't say we, oh, we solved this problem or made progress. Uh, but just the mere fact of setting up something of getting people to start to think about it, I see that as a sort of a huge achievement. I think the one thing I did learn was that it takes a long time. So I mm -hmm. think the one thing I'm trying to be now is much more patient and saying that, you know, I should be doing something for the next seven to 10 years, not you know, 18 months. For 18 months you or two years or three years, you can build an immediate outcome, but you won't see the impact at all actually for, you know, five, seven, 10 years. So actually trying to build towards that is, is sort of the next step of, of my career. Uh, so I'm particularly proud of the center because it was new, Ashoka University is a new university. Um, and we really got a lot of great traction. So really, really proud of that one. Uh, and then, of course, of the kinds of projects and the, and the quality of that. But I think mostly about setting up that level of excitement around uh, this kind of work in development. Also with the work with the, you know, the life you can save. I mean, it's a great organization, so I haven't done too much. So nothing I can take credit for. But just to be associated with that. And if, if I can have changed or, you know, help, uh, even one person uh, recently, for example, this is a really small thing on a Facebook group that I'm in, I just wrote about my donation strategy, right? And a few people actually wrote back saying that, hey, thank you, because, you know, that helped me to think about uh, my donations. And I feel if I've shifted even a few of those behaviors, that's, that's worth it. That's sort of the return on investment. So those are the sort of small achievements that I feel quite proud of. 
That's amazing. So there's a couple of things I want to ask you some further questions on uh, in that answer. So for people who don't already know, can you tell me a little bit about the Centre for Social and Behavioural Change and like key priorities and projects that they're currently working on firstly? Yeah, so the centre was funded by, uh, started by the Gates Foundation, funded by them in 2017. And the idea of the centre was to have a centre in India, for India, uh, which would advance um, sort of um, really good behavior change programs. What do I mean by behavior change programs? If you think about interventions, um, you think about, say, vaccinations, right? So you have to do a number of things. You have to have a policy around it, and then you've got to have the actual supply in place. You've got to have all of that stuff in place. But, you know, as many of us know, even when all that is in place and things are provided free, people still don't actually uptake on many things. There's still a behavior change problem. Uh, and that has to do with the motivations people have, the beliefs they have, the norms they have, as well as, you know, some of the intent to action gaps. They're really motivated to get their children vaccinated. They just forget to do it on the day. So there are still huge gaps in, you know, many, whether it is, you know, people not going for tuberculosis screening at the right time or pregnant women not taking um, uh, anything to combat anemia, which could have effects on unborn children. That's in public health, people not saving enough uh, for retirement, uh, even when they can, even with very low resources and financial security. These are all behavioral problems. And so the question, so I think what the foundation thought was that, and rightly so, was there's, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of organizations doing messaging and communications work. There's a lot of design organizations doing design work. Uh, but there's not a lot of evidence uh, that any of this is actually changing behaviors. I mean, there's very little sort of evidence, for example, on does information alone actually change behavior? And the answer is yes, it does in some cases, but under very specific cases. If it works in one setting, does it work in another setting? And you know, more than programs, you know, behavior change is hard because it's all about individual people and the social context in which they are. So very often behavior change, communication and design programs that work in one setting just don't seem to have the same response in another setting. Um, you know, if we invest a huge lot in a, in a public service advertising campaign or in a digital campaign or in a soap opera, will it actually change anything at all? We know that these things are very entertaining, but we don't know if it will actually change behavior. So I think the idea was that there wasn't a center that was actually sort of um, uh, make on the behavior change side, we weren't being very scientific. We had a lot of creative agencies, but we didn't have a lot of people who were actually looking at these problems from a very analytical lens. And so the idea of the center was to, to be that center for uh, advancing behavior change programs. So there's three things that we did. One is projects, because unless you can show how you can do a better job, it's hard to preach to anyone else. Um, mm -hmm. So some of the projects in public health, for example, a big, big problem in India is 50% of women have anemia. And anemia seems like a very innocuous problem for those of us, you know, in the West, except that if you're poor and you have anemia and you have severe anemia, you know, you can have low birth weight babies and it can lead to maternal mortality and these hosts of consequences. Uh, there are many solutions for anemia. One of those is to take an iron and folic acid supplement every day for your pregnancy, and that is provided free of cost. There are lots of supply constraints and so on, but basically let's assume that this, this tablet is provided free of cost. And yet the self-reported compliance, women saying that they take this is actually extremely low, ranging from 11% of women saying that they've even taken these tablets and not even regularly, mind you, to maybe a high of 30, 35%. So how do you actually increase compliance? That's a classic sort of project that we would undertake and uh, Obviously, you know, the, it's, it's a long-term project, but, you know, you start out by saying, how would we do that? Um, so those are projects and we did, uh, pro we are, and are doing projects in public health, sanitation, how do you get people to, uh, you know, to, to use, um, to reduce open defecation uh, in, um, H uh, in HPV vaccination, you know, how do you get uh, physicians to recommend HPV vaccination uh, for, for young girls, especially in rural areas, um, doing some work around data privacy. So in the, in the public health, those are the projects in financial, you know, data privacy is really important to get people to trust the digital uh, banking system. Um, and then there were a few other projects. So those are projects. The second area was research. 
So, you know, doing things like what's the role of celebrities, for example, in persuasion, a lot of people spending a lot of money in India and other countries using celebrities, does it really work? So doing that kind of either applied or foundational research, uh, there's very little research uh, outside of what you might term as weird countries, Western educated, industrialized, rich, democratic. So really getting more research there is critical, I think. Uh, all of behavioral science, most of it is based on uh, undergrad samples from North America and Europe. So, you know, it's a really understudied area. And then finally, the third area would be training. Um, there are no, you know, for example, in, in behavior science, in design, there's very few universities that even teach this in, in, in places like India. Um, all of the big sort of educational institutes are in, in the West. So how can you sort of train people? How can you, because there's very, as a center, there's only this much you can do. Ultimately, the leverage of the center is training other people to do this kind of work systematically. So that's some of the work that, uh, that we essentially did to advance sort of better thinking, I would say, on behavior change programs. So if you could go back and tell your junior professional self like a piece of advice, um, either with regards to behavioral change or other work, what would that advice be? Yeah, no, you know, I think that uh, being flexible is sort of the biggest advice. So even in my team at, at the center, the ones who are better able to adapt were, were people who were flexible, who were sort of able to pull through um, different disciplines and who weren't, you know, I need this plan and I need it to be done exactly this way because uh, it's a very new area. Well, but then at a junior level, what I really valued is also getting things done. So very often I'd have people say, oh, but let's discuss the whole strategy behind this problem. And I'd be like, well, then we'd be discussing this for the next 10 years. We're not going to get anything done. And the only way to get done is, and I'm really dating myself here, but I used to play a game called Minesweeper um, when I was you know, young. Many of you won't remember it. Minesweeper essentially you have to get all the mines on a board. And the way that you do that is you get one mine and then you click the surrounding boards. And if they don't have mines, they open up etc etc till the so you've got to make some calculations about where you move next but the key of minesweeper is you have to start somewhere you don't have there's no like strategy you have to start somewhere and then the next key is you have to keep moving you have to do the next thing and the next thing till the board opens up you can die uh, you'll get killed by a mine but the board can also open up so from the way that i work is very much like a minesweeper thing you have to start and so I found some people, some, you know, more junior professionals are often paralyzed. They wanted the whole problem before they could actually like even start. And I would say, let's just start. And then the second thing is that they often couldn't move to the next step. So that's a really valuable skill. If you can both be flexible, but you also have this can do that. Yes, I'm going to do this thing. And I think it's super important to do what you're committing to do at the time that you say that you will do it. Because the more junior you are in the organization, the more you are the bottleneck. If you don't do your thing at that time, uh, the people that you, you work with, the more senior people only had that window of time to either review your work or work with you. So it's, you know, I've had people who, um, you know, they were perfectionists and they told me they would get me something at 5 p.m. on, you know, Wednesday and it's Thursday afternoon and I'm like, where's that thing? And it's thrown the entire schedule off gear. And I don't think they realized it. I think they realized that their, their thinking was, I'd rather do something really well and give it to you 12 hours later. What they didn't realize is the value of those 12 hours is far higher than any improvement that you can do on your own. So I would say being flexible, uh, being able to really move and get things done and being absolutely reliable and consistent are things that at least from my point, I would value from being a sort of a junior. And I wish I had done more of that as a junior professional. That's amazing. Thank you so much. I have never heard the Minesweeper uh, example, but it's a thought I've been like throwing around for a while. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so Neela and I both work at The Life You Can Save together. Um, so this isn't so much for me, but Neela, can you tell me a little bit about The Life You Can Save and what The Life You Can Save are up to right now? Uh, what work are you doing with The Life You Can Save? Um, and what work are you hoping to do with The Life You Can Save in the future? So the life you can save actually was, the book was my entry into effective altruism, I should say. And uh, Actually, before that, Peter had written an article in 28, 29, maybe, that said, uh, a billionaire gives so much, what should you? 
And he'd actually like sort of written this article. I think it was at the time that Bill Gates had announced a big gift. And so he had said, well, here's what Bill Gates has announced, but should you, do you have an obligation to give more? And I think the way that he so carefully calculated that really sort of struck me. And, you know, it wasn't like, yes, of course I should give more, but he'd actually said, this is what it would take to solve the problem. And I love things when people say you can actually solve a problem at some point. So the book was my introduction. And then I sort of said, there must be something around this. So as usual, I Googled and found the organization. And what the Life You Can Save does is essentially uh, wants to do two things. One is to spread the idea of the book, right? And the idea of the book is a simple idea that we can all do our part to end world poverty. And one of the easiest, I would say, and I say easiest because most convenient, not necessarily, you know, easy. Uh, things to do is to give effectively to organizations, to effective organizations. So number one is we need to give. The second is we probably need to give more than what we think we are giving. And there is scope for all of us to give more. And, you know, Peter shows that. Um, and then the third is that we need to give most effectively, because if we are giving, then, you know, it makes sense to give to more effective rather than to less effective organizations. So that combination of those of us who can should give, give more and then give to more effective organizations is it's really the primary message of the life you can save. And in doing that, you can actually uh, save lives, whether that is for more immediate things, you know, like preventing malaria and, uh, and of course, it, you know, it does not in any way discredit the fact that you still need growth, you still need advocacy, you still need uh, justice, you still need all of these big things to happen uh, for the world to be a fundamentally different place. But here is what you can do now to advance that. So again, very minesweeper kind of analogy. Here's what you can do to advance that world that you want to see. So I'm doing two things. I mean, I think there are uh, two things there. One is spreading this message to as many people as possible especially people who don't necessarily are not necessarily what they would be part of an effective altruism movement right so spreading this idea and it, it is a new idea for people outside of of the movement not that they should give but that they should give this much and that they should give to certain organizations i think the third one is the hardest for people to grasp that they should give to particular organizations versus others so a list of 22 recommended charities that the life you can save actually has to make that process easier uh, a lot of that list is taken from the give well list. So the, that's an exactly a subset of this, uh, as well as a few other charity evaluators. So there's a list because, you know, what we found is that most people outside of sort of the effective altruism community, the way they decide is they pick a cause that they sort of resonate with. It's like you asked me, how did I decide to get into development? It was an emotional reaction. And then they want to do good within that cause. So it's really hard to tell them this is the only charity you should only donate to against Malaria Foundation if what they want to do is to support girls' education, because maybe that's the way that they actually came up in life, right? So, so we take a much broader view. We're really targeting the sort of the literally the average person. And we are saying that, you know, we are not going to tell you what's the best cause. We could, but, you know, here are a few causes, women's education, global health, financial livelihoods, etc. Here are the most effective charities that you might think about donating to and really get them uh, to do that. Um, so right now, there's actually uh, an appeal. I mean, a lot of charities are working on COVID-19 work. And so right now, one way that you can help is actually going and spreading the word and donating, you know, to these charities that are doing work. DMI is doing messaging work, evidence action with chlorine dispensers, give directly is giving cash directly. So, you know, a lot of people doing work. But I think that in this time, there's also a, a lack of attention on general global poverty. And I think that's equally important because what's going to happen is that all the resources and attention are focused on COVID. And we're seeing that already tuberculosis rates might go up, measles rates might go up because of immunization being paused, uh, you know, basic poverty, people will slide even further into poverty. So I think it's important to keep an eye on general poverty. So we're trying to also give that message that while you should donate to COVID-19, you should remember that these are all 
on undergoing causes. These make pandemics work a worse global poverty and you should donate to that. I also just want to put a shout out that we're on Kindle right now. Sorry, I'm going to hijack this <laughs> for a bit. Please spread the word. Um, you know, we wanted to get a broader audience, as I said. So we are on Kindle and hopefully the Kindle audience can download the book and read. The audiobook's available for free on the website. It has Stephen Fry, Paul Simon, etc. you know, lending their voices. Um, the book itself is available on Amazon. We had to price it for um, 99 cents. So what happened last year, we took back the book and we said we make it free to everyone. We don't think price should be a factor in spreading the book. The book is available for 99 cents just because we have to price it because Amazon requires us to. But please spread the word around and have people sort of download it and read it and talk about it because that's what we want. We want to get like millions of people involved in this kind of effective giving movement. So moving on to a little bit about effective altruism. So it seems pretty fair to say that your like EA origin story and your kind of EA aha moment uh, was reading Peter Singer. So what do you find particularly engaging and inspiring about effective altruism? I think it's very empowering. The fact that I can actually do something, you know, so of course there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of emotion at the injustice of the world, but it gives you a really good way to channel that and say, I can do something. And that appeals to, I think, the rational, rationalist, MBA, pragmatic, solution-oriented self. So I find that very challenging, very empowering. And, you know, I, I found it very interesting that you can do it in a variety of ways, right? So there was this concept, I know it's, it's a little downplayed now, but I still find it very engaging of earning to give. Because for many people in my position, especially people who come late into effective altruism, you often can't change your career or life path. You know, you have certain constraints in place. You have a family. In my case, we have dual careers. My husband has his career. Uh, so it's, it's not easy to say I'm going to go and do direct work in, you know, in, in Kenya or in the Philippines. And, and even mm. if you were, are you really qualified to do that, right? So for those people, they can still do something. So I love the different parts by which uh, change was possible. So, you know, you don't have to do it yourself. Uh, you can, but you have resources at your disposal that you can put to use. Uh, and it gives you a very clear way forward. And the other thing I found really inspiring, although I must say I'm not at all close to them, is all the individual stories. So Toby Ord's story about how he calculated that he could, you know, save so much, so many lives. There's the Citibank guy right now, Alan Saldana, who wrote recently, he's no relative. He wrote recently about how he gives so much of his money. Jeff and Julia, who write about how and these are all people living their lives. They're doing things that, you know, in another world, they'd be my friends. Um, but so I find it very inspiring that this is everyday people. This is not a separate cohort of people who are, you know, joining the Peace Corps and doing things that I could never do. So I think that something I like to really reflect on when I'm like motivating my current actions is like, what's the end game here? So like in 10 years, if we can achieve one thing, what is it? And on the flip side, if we don't achieve that, why? Like in speculation, like why don't we? So you're asking a mass marketer. I mean, for me, like right. the one, everybody in the world could have a little bit of an effective altruist mindset in them. And I'm not being purist about this. For me, it's more important mm -hmm. that it's scale versus, uh, you know, that it's very purist. Um, and by effective altruist, I mean, whatever is the simplest sort of construct of that, if it is just saying that I am going to at least examine with a more critical eye where I'm donating my money, you know, uh, at the first level, it could be how I'm spending my time, it could be what's the cause area, you know, you could broaden it as you go along, but even for the person who's just giving money from a purely emotional standpoint to actually have a little bit of that critical analysis. That would be like, I would love for everyone to have that, but that's, that's me. I know there are a lot of people who think that maybe the end game is getting a, a much, just a stronger movement, but much narrower movement. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's, it's sort of scale and broad appeal. So earlier on, um, you said that if you could give a junior EA, you know, a piece of advice, then it would be really flexibility. Um, but like, are there skills or insights or projects that you would really like to see emerge from within the EA community or surrounding communities um, over the coming months? And if so, what projects would you really like to see emerge? I mean, given my area of interest, I would like to see much more on behavior change and information mm. um, and how that actually drives behavior and in which conditions it is valuable. 
uh, and in which conditions just giving people cash, for example, is a better thing to do. Because I've seen, obviously, the USAID defunded study, I think, which showed that, you know, giving cash was more effective than a nutrition intervention, which also had some communication elements to it. So I would love to see, I don't think there's enough work that we know. So often the conclusion is information, change, information provision doesn't work. Or the people who love information say, of course, it works. And people are people and you need to motivate them. I think the answer mm -hmm. is somewhere in between and sort of, I would love to see more exploration of that. When does behavior, when do communication programs work? What must you do? Uh, under what conditions can you transfer a program? Um, you know, what is, when do you just give cash to people instead of trying to persuade them to change their behavior and things like that. Okay, so moving on to the first question on our questions for Neela document. So how receptive are policymakers to the recommendations from your behavioral science team? What challenges did you have? So they're extremely, I mean, I was surprised. I think that even more than the private sector, I see a lot more receptivity to things like behavioral science in the, in the public sector. And of course, with the focus, the Nobel Prize and so on, there's even more of a focus on experimentation. I think policymakers are, and I, and I definitely understand their position, are you know, understandably a little nervous about doing too much experimentation. Um, and, uh, and taking the risk that is associated with something not working because 50%, when we did studies, you know, 50% of even small scale lab experiments showed no effect or didn't work the way that we wanted them to. So I think uh, their, their concern is how do you de-risk this? But I think they're actually incredibly open to, uh, to doing some of this, um, this work, yeah. And so what are some examples of behavioral uh, changes that have really advanced development or helped with alleviating poverty? Um, so I think that, you know, the, the big, uh, I don't know if it's behavior change, but certainly it was a concerted campaign is the polio campaign, uh, mm -hmm. which is really, really, you know, helped. And of course, it's uh, again, and this is where we need to understand what's the role of the behavior change in communication and what's the role of the provision of services themselves. Uh, but it was something that was, there was, uh, there was a community mobilization effort with Rotary and UNICEF and others. There was obviously great policies and there was a lot of attention and resources. The other big success actually, which a lot of people don't talk about is HIV in India. So, you know, India was on the cusp of being um, sort of, uh, you know, HIV and 1.3 billion people. It it's, could be a global crisis and actually it's been contained. And a lot of that is some very hard work. Uh, and a lot of that is uh, is behavior change. And if anyone has, you know, here's a great resource. Uh, it's written by Ashok Alexander. And he was the head, I think, of the Gates Foundation at that point and really responsible for the Avahan campaign. Uh, it, it's a great, I think it's a great resource. He talked to sex workers and, uh, and you know, what you learn. And it's just a great sort of behavior change uh, campaign. I mean, there are very few only behavior change campaigns, but these are some of the places in which I think some very thoughtful behavior change is actually uh, advanced public health outcomes. Fantastic. And I think a question that uh, I like really go back and forward a lot on um, because, you know, we're, we're doing projects and testing projects that don't necessarily have a huge amount of evidence for them because they're in their infancy. But do you think it's more important to work on interventions that are testable by RCT or do you think um, it's important to work on interventions that are difficult to test? Like, how do we make a prioritization? Because there are just some projects that are really difficult to, uh, to test in this way. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's a hard question and it's a constant mm. reprioritization, I think. And, you know, things like advocacy, for example, it's hard to tell, uh, you know, what the effect is. Uh, I do push for saying at least, even if we can't realistically test it, at least pushing for disciplined thinking in terms of what's the outcome. So, you know, when people say we want to do an attitude survey, I'm like, why do you want to do this? You know, what, what are you going to get from doing an attitude survey? Unless it's linked to some theory that you have that it will change behavior in this particular way. And if that happens, then we should see this. Now you might say, well, that's going to be really hard to measure. So I'll give you an example. When we were doing the anemia work, now you can't measure, it's really hard. It takes a long time to measure whether women are taking the tablet and then if it has any effect on anemia. I mean, so first of all, you know, we don't know that if women consistently take this, it will have an effect given their poor nutrition on anemia itself. So that's something you have to say, okay, trust the science experts. And they told us that, yes, this does have an effect. 
uh, but also you have to take it for like nine months and we can't really wait for nine months to see the outcome of this. So then we started looking at proxy behaviors. If we do this message, uh, does that, you know, does, so what is that behavior? The behavior is taking a pill every day, right? So we say, if we can get people to do that, then we can get them to take it for nine months and then we can see that thing. So the first thing that they have to do is to take that pill every day. Now we can't even observe them taking the pill every day. So what's a proxy behavior that we can do in a lab to study that? And so we said, well, they have to do something that costs a little bit of effort uh, and that they have to do every day. So in this case, it was making a phone call. So they had to make a missed phone call. Now in which world is a missed phone call equivalent to taking a, a tablet, right? But it's like, it is saying, what is the psychological mechanism behind taking a tablet, right? It is putting, having some effort and planning it just a micro plan and that's the same variables that you use when you're making this phone call, right? That it's a thing that you have to do that's a little bit of effort with a little bit of planning. So it could be a reasonable proxy. I mean, there could be lots of other reasons it's not. So I think at least trying to be disciplined enough about thinking that what is it that we can show whether this is working? But having said that, I recognize there are lots of programs and campaigns that it's not possible to really get that, then you try and work with, you know, other ways of data. I mean, at least try and see are people engaged? Are they recalling information correctly? You know, are there barriers between their uh, motivation and, uh, and you try and solve for those and action and you try and solve for those. We don't know enough about, uh, you know, we have RCTs on one side, which take three to five years and are extremely expensive. So they can't be applied to every mm -hmm. intervention. We have what psychologists do lab experiments, but they have their limitations. So, you know, exactly the question that you asked, like what sorts of outcomes should we be measuring and what's a good way to measure those? And bear in mind that actually we have a huge issue because all the scales, et cetera, that have been developed are very global north. So even the simplest attitude scale, we've actually got to see whether it works in the countries that we want to test this in with low literate, low resource populations. So I'd love to see, I think, much more sophisticated work around that. Fantastic. Okay, so this segues really wonderfully uh, into your views on India as a philanthropic market. Can you tell us about the trends and or the direction of travel and potential in the Indian philanthropic market? It's or a very interesting market. I don't know too much about it. Mm -hmm. I'm learning about it myself, mm -hmm. but I can tell you a few things, I think. So one, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting because when you say India, you say, you know, 1.3 billion people, it's generally thought of as a reasonably poor country, but there's at least a a few hundred million, which is equivalent to a small European country of very affluent people. So mm -hmm. I think if you start to break down the India into the different segments then and stop thinking of it as one country, then you realize actually the, the philanthropic potential. Um, I think that uh, there has not been uh, a lot of effective altruism in India in terms of the thoughts. Um, I think in some ways I find pushback when I talk to people because the scale of the problem is so large that they don't feel we should be discussing it that dispassionately, ironically, like they feel like, you know, you're getting taken something out of the conversation because as long as someone is trying to do good, then let's just encourage that. Uh, so they don't feel this sort of, you know, what's the way to do the most good. Uh, you have very large uh, foundations now, um, in, uh, large foundations being set up in India, the, the Premji Foundation, etc., which are highly, highly influential. Um, and I think the one thing in India is that it's actually a very vibrant, uh, grassroots level place. That's the way the social movement started in India. And there's lots of highly intelligent, vibrant grass folks working at the grassroots who feel that their voices are now being ignored by what they call this technocratic component of international organizations uh, going on. And in many cases, you know, instead of starting a new organization, something to do is actually to knit together these grassroots level organizations into a more effective structure because they really understand the people that they're working with. They're working under very low constraints and they have some fabulous ideas that just don't you know, because, because they may not make PowerPoint presentations or, you know, speak corporate, uh, they, they don't even come up to the radar of the, and they don't have the resources and the infrastructure to, to do that. So I would say that, you know, advocating for effective altruism, but within an Indian framework, one of those things is that, for example, a lot of the organizations right now are very Africa focused. And, you know, for someone in India, it's just not that relevant. Uh, they're mm -hmm. like, that's great, but you know, I'm not going to go and give to give directly when I have people here who are migrant laborers who are starving because of the lockdown. 
So I think that having more, and they're working on that actually, what are the Indian effective charities that people would want to give to? Because I think they'd be much more receptive to that, but doing a lot more work around that. And mm -hmm. uh, maybe there are some Indian um, charities that are not traditionally, you know, considered effective, like they don't have a great management structure, but they're actually doing some pretty neat and effective work that we can then sort of strengthen. So I think on the on the supply side, that's where philanthropy needs to focus. And then on the giving, I think there's huge opportunity to make that giving much more systematic. One of the things I heard was that we don't really even have a standard for how much to give. So, you know, the religions tell you how much you should give, but there's no sort of like a, the giving pledge or, you know, 10% or whatever that is. And um, and I think someone needs to start to talk about, and we're hoping to do that through the life you can save, talk about what that standard is if you're affluent. Because what's happened, and I can see that anecdotally in the last 20 years, there's been tremendous growth in incomes. So the India I left is very different from the India I went back to in 2017. And you know, for those of us who live in a developed country, this might be this, but incomes have exploded. Like you, you are earning literally 20 times what you were earning you know, 10 years ago or whatever. Uh, but people haven't realized how rich they are. So that's mm -hmm. why the standard for giving. So they're still giving 500 rupees thinking that, you know, that's great because that's what their parents give in my own sort of fairly affluent circle. Uh, but 500 rupees gets you nothing in India nowadays uh, from a standard of living. So I think just getting people used to this idea of how much to give and that you should be giving much more, a lot more needs to be done on, I think, uh, the demand side. But it is a very homegrown country. So I think it's hard to dictate from the West. I think India really wants to build its own institutions. And so the best thing I would do is to say, go local and actually really get into the philanthropic ecosystem there understand that make there are some fabulous local partners give india dasra etc you know get in with them understand what the indian sort of giver wants and then tailor effective altruism around that i've got a couple of questions actually about education um and about like if you have a junior uh, career person who is perhaps considering a profession like yours um, what kind of graduate or even postgraduate uh, studies might you pursue? And also what kind of professional experiences uh, might you be wanting to gain? So in terms of graduate or postgraduate, a few skills I think which are in short supply are uh, data science, but data science from a very demand perspective. And the reason I say this is because, you know, behavior, behavioral science tells you how to do something, but doesn't tell you where to focus. So mm -hmm. you still need sort of to understand by looking at data where the hotspots are, where your intervention can have the most impact. Uh, so I would say very people oriented data science, uh, you know, what, uh, where you would get jobs as sort of marketing intelligence folks in, uh, in, in marketing firms. Uh, is I think really, really understudied because, you know, a lot of data sciences and artificial intelligence is directed at non behavior change sort of interventions. Um, and uh, of course, behavioral science or beha behavioral economics, social psychology, those are always, uh, you know, skills that are, again, very valued and any training in that, especially experimental training in design. Um, and lots of people have read the books, all of the, you know, the Daniel Kahnemans and the Danny Rielis, but few people know how to actually design and run an experiment. Um, so I think skills and, and analyze and, and experiment. So I'd say those hard methodological skills about how do you do this. Um, and then, of course, newer ways of using data, the artificial intelligences and the, the machine learnings. I also think that the, the, the big skill now is digital, learning about digital marketing, uh, because uh, in places like India, digital is overtaking mass media. So uh, you, you really need to know about the different platforms and how to use them, even if you don't know it from a, from a science point of view, from the evidence point of view, from the interventions point of view. How do you use Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and TikTok and all of these different things more effectively to spread your message? Uh, you know, how, does, how do you target different audiences and do that? So that's from a sort of a skill sets. Uh, technical skill sets, then I think that there's a gender shortage of, I would say, management skill sets. So, you know, that, that's another thing to actually pick up. Um, just general management, how do you structure a project? How do you get from point A to point B? How are team members? What's the role of each team member? 
and then things like presenting and delivering your ideas. So I would say only a career professional should probably focus on something like that. That's, that's, I hope that's broad enough. That's uh, amazing. The- thank you so much. I say an absolutely huge thank you uh, to everybody who attended. And Neela, thank you so much. Thank you. I hope that was uh, helpful or useful. It and was I'm happy perfect. To thank you. So great. Thank you.